That concludes the bounds portion of the lecture, and we can now move on to sensitivity analysis. So if we have unconfoundedness, if we have some confounders W that block all backdoor paths or give us conditional exchangeability, give us unconfoundedness, then we have that the average treatment effect equals this quantity on the right here, the adjustment formula. And importantly, the unconfoundedness assumption allows us to identify a point for the ATE, right? We get exactly this point on the right-hand side here. This gives us a point. In the last part of the lecture, we just completely threw out the unconfoundedness assumption and considered other weaker assumptions that allowed us to identify intervals rather than points. In the sensitivity analysis part of the lecture, we will still assume unconfoundedness, but now we're going to assume that we have unconfoundedness given both the observed W and the observed U. So this means that we have to adjust for both W and U in the adjustment formula here. So rather than throwing out the unconfoundedness assumption, we're still keeping the unconfoundedness assumption, but we only have unconfoundedness given unobserved confounders U. And we want to know how close this quantity where we've adjusted for both W and U is to the quantity where we only adjust for W. Because W is all we can adjust for. It's the only confounders we've observed. We haven't observed U. That's what we'll consider in this sensitivity analysis portion of the lecture. And we'll spend most of our time in this simple linear setting. So we have linear functions and a single confounder. This will allow us to make everything clear as all the reasoning and derivations is pretty straightforward in this setting. So more specifically, we'll be considering this graph where the SCM we have is that t is a linear function of w and u, right? So t equals alpha w times w plus alpha u times u. And similarly, y is a linear function of w, u, and treatment where these beta coefficients are the numbers connecting w and u to y. And importantly, this delta is the causal effect of t on y. So our goal is to recover delta. The reason delta is the causal effect of t on y is because delta is what's in front of t in the structural equation that generates y. In other words, when t changes here, the way that y changes depends on delta. So if t goes from 0 to 1, then y increases by delta, holding everything else constant. So in this simple linear setting, it turns out that we can actually get the bias in a closed form expression. First, we know that the average treatment effect is equal to when we use the adjustment formula, where we adjust for both w and u, and this gives us delta. But what will we get if we only adjust for w? It turns out that this actually gives us delta plus some bias term, where the bias is the beta u, so the term in front of u in the structural equation for y, divided by alpha u, where alpha u is the factor in front of u in the structural equation for t. And the proof is coming for this after the next slide. Given this equality, we can get, then get the bias for this estimate where we only adjust for w. So we just plug in this delta plus beta u divided by alpha u, and then subtract the true quantity delta. This gives us just beta u divided by alpha u for the bias of when we don't adjust for u. We only adjust for w. So then for specific values of beta u and alpha u, we can get different amounts of bias. So we'll, we can draw contour plots for sensitivity to confounding. Here we'll plot the bias of this estimate when we don't adjust for u. And we put 1 over alpha u on the x-axis and beta u on the y-axis. Here these curves describe the values of beta u and 1 over alpha u that we need to get bias of 1. So any point on these curves gives us a bias of 1, where this bias here is beta u over alpha u, as we saw on the previous slide. Then we can make a contour plot, so we can draw additional 
curves for different levels of bias. So for a bias of 10, we would need beta u and 1 over alpha u to fall somewhere on this orange curve. And we could draw more contours, such as for bias of 25 and for 50. Okay, so these kinds of sensitivity plots, where we plot the contours, where each contour corresponds to a specific level of bias, these plots are very useful for sensitivity analysis. So here we've just plotted bias, but maybe a more useful way is to consider that we have a specific estimate. So here you can think of this estimand as an estimate that we would get if we had infinite data, and say that we know that that is 25. So say we estimated this 25 using infinite data in this case. You could do this with finite data too. It would just be that you have some sampling error. So by having infinite data, we're not worrying about sampling error. We're only worrying about confounding error, confounding bias. Anyway, in this plot, we could be interested in plotting delta, given specific values of beta u and alpha u. That's different from in this plot where we're plotting the bias. That's just beta u over alpha u. So in this plot, given that this guy is equal to 25, for specific value of beta u and value of alpha u, we can get a value of delta. So here, if the confounding equals zero, that's for beta u equals zero, or one over alpha u equals zero. I could plot two lines here that are at right angle to each other, as a contour for the delta equals 25, because these guys are zero. But I will just summarize it in a point here for now. Anyway, so that is zero confounding, but say I wanted to know how much confounding I would need for my true delta to actually be zero. That would be the case if we were on this contour, this green contour here. So if we have values of one over alpha u and beta u that fall on this green curve, then delta is zero. That's how much confounding we would need to basically change the sign of our causal effect from the estimate that we got here, where we weren't adjusting for u, to something where confounding is so strong, confounding by u is so strong, that it actually changes the sign to zero. So say the main thing we cared about is that we had a positive causal effect and that we estimated this right here, 25. Then what we would need to argue is that the confounding parameters, beta u and one over alpha u, fall somewhere below this green contour. Okay, if they fall anywhere in here, then the causal effect is really positive. Delta is greater than zero. So that's a common example of how people would use sensitivity analysis in a paper. It could be that you don't want to argue that your delta is greater than zero, you might want to argue that it's greater than 15, say, in which case it would be below this orange line. So we would need the sensitivity parameters, one over delta u and beta u, to fall somewhere on this side of the orange curve, if we wanted to argue that delta is greater than or equal to 15. These contour plots are a really useful tool that sensitivity analysis gives us. And that hopefully conveys most of the intuition and the results that we have in this linear single confounder setting. But if you remember on the last side, we said we'd actually prove that result that we got for the bias, that the bias is just beta u divided by alpha u. And it's actually worth going through this proof in the lecture. It happens to be fairly straightforward, so it's not so bad. We'll see the outline of the proof here. First, remember that we assumed this linear SCM. And here was the result. The confounding bias of adjusting for just w and not u is beta u divided by alpha u. More formally, the estimate where we adjust for only w minus the estimate where we adjust for both w and u, so that gives us the true value. The difference between these two, the, the confounding bias, is beta u over alpha u. And here's the proof outline that we'll see. The first step is the main step, and it's that we're going to get a closed form expression for 
this here, where we just have t equals little t, in terms of the alphas and the betas. Then we'll use what we got in step one, that closed form expression from step one, to get a closed form expression for this difference that we see here. And then in step three, we're just going to subtract off this portion here, the thing where we adjust for both w and u. On this slide, we'll do step one, which is the main step here. So we want to get a closed form expression for this quantity in terms of the alphas and betas. Here's that quantity. And the first thing we're going to use is the structural equation for y. We just plug this in for y here. So we get this. Then if we just use linearity of expectation to push this conditional expectation through to all of these terms, we get the following. Because we've conditioned on w, we keep this big w here and we push this in conditional expectation into u and it looks like that. And because we've conditioned on t equals little t, this delta big t turns into a delta little t because we conditioned on little t. Now to work out the conditional expectation for u given t comma w, we need to use the structural equation for t. So if we just solve for u in terms of t and w, then we get this. And then if we just condition on t equals little t and w, big w here, then we end up with this. So the big T becomes a little t, and w stays a big w, a random variable. Big letters are random variables, recall that, and little letters are values, not random variables. Then if we just distribute through that beta u to that parenthesis, we get this. And finally, we can use linearative expectation for this expectation over w. So only the terms that depend on w will have that expectation still in them. So now all these w's become expected value of w. And finally, we'll rearrange a bit to get a term that depends on t and a term that does not depend on t. So the term that depends on t is the important one because we want to know the causal effect of t on y. So stuff that changes with t is what's important. The stuff that doesn't change with t, you'll see, is not, not so important. So that was pretty much the bulk of the proof. The rest of it's very simple. Here's what we had from step one. And now if in step two, remember that we're going to plug in t equals one and t equals zero and take the difference. So all we do is just plug in those for t, plug in one for t and zero for t to get this. You see that because there's a minus sign here, this term cancels with this term, and this term has a zero, so it's just zero, so all we're left with is just this. We get just delta plus beta u divided by alpha u. That's step two. Now we have this closed form expression for this ATE here. And now all that's left in step three is to just subtract off the true value, where we adjust for u in addition to w. So this delta plus beta u divided by alpha u is what we just saw is equal to this difference in the last slide. And then the minus delta comes from the true value. As a reminder, this is the graph in SCM where I've taken the beta u and alpha u and put them on the edges. So the beta u is like the edge from u to y, and the alpha u is like the edge from u to t. So as you would expect, by not adjusting for u, we end up with confounding bias that depends on alpha u and beta u. So we end up dividing by alpha u and then multiplying by beta u as we get this confounding association flowing from t to y. In this simple linear setting, we've considered the ATE in this simple graph. The ATE is just one causal estimate that one might be interested in, and this is just one simple graph that one might be interested in. For arbitrary estimates and arbitrary graphs, where the structural equations are still linear, so it's still linear structural causal models, go ahead and see this sensitivity analysis of linear structural causal models paper from Sinelli et al. 2019. This brings us to the questions for this section. The first is one that you might have had in your head at some point during this section, which is, 
why is this quantity equal to delta? So given this SCM, go ahead and show that yourself. The next question is that does what we've shown in this section work if W is a vector? So can we imagine treating everywhere we see an alpha times W or beta times W as a dot product between two vectors? And then how about if U is a vector? Can U be more than one confounder and all the stuff that on the last few slides still work?